I want to thank the Bradley Selection Committee for giving me the, the stipend in the first place and then inviting me back this, this fall to do this. It's a great thing. Uh, so the Historical Society has been wonderful to me. Uh, the, the staff up at the Research Center, Brian and Molly and her crew, and Lori up in uh, photos. Um, Molly Holtz is out there at Montana. Uh, she's been great, especially since she hasn't got anything yet to really show this has been worth anything. So anyway, thanks to all of you guys. Uh, let's see, find my little clicker here, make sure everything's going right. I kind of struck on the, the theme of this year's uh, program the, here, the Montana Milestones. And of course, one of the big milestones was uh, November 89, statehood. But about eight months later, uh, I think another pretty big milestone, milestone came to Montana. That was on July 30th, 1890. Whooping cowboys and determined horses gingerly urged 3,500 longhorn steers sporting a huge XIT brand across their right ribs into the rushing waters of the Yellowstone River. It was Jul July 30th, 1890, just above Fort Keogh, west of Mile City. The herd was the lead bunch, nearly 10,000, two, three, Four-year-old steers driven over the trail from the Union Pacific Railhead at uh, Windover, Wyoming. George Finley and Osceola C. Cato sat astride horses on the north side of the river watching the action. Finley was a Chicago-based manager of Texas's famed XIT Ranch. The three million acre payoff for constructing the country's largest state house, the monumental pink granite capital in Austin. Cato was a 32-year-old cowhound from Texas, had been a trail boss, and he'd recently been hired to manage the ranch's satellite operation in Montana. Carried from the Texas panhandle by rail, the bees were representative of a new wave of cattle ranching on the eastern Montana prairies and on the northern ranges. Although Texas cattle began appearing in the plains of Wyoming, Montana, and the D Dakotas in the late 1870s, the focus of the Montana cattle business shifted after completion of the east-west northern Pacific road in 1882. Rather than supplying the mining and lumber districts of the, re of the western part of the territory for ranches there, Texas-style open-range ranching in the eastern and northern sections of the territory and state became the focal point of the beef industry. Cattle went east, east, increasingly so after the Great Northern arrived in the early 1890s. An even newer phase in the cattle business emerged from the disastrous winter of 1886, the big die-up. Many experienced disaster, in the wake of the storms that winter while others uh, found opportunity. A network of financial, political forces dominated this new era of what I call imperial ranches and came to wield near hegemonic power within those regions where inexperienced new state governments, limited federal resources, and financially burdened railroads were unable or unwilling to regulate land use. Findlay utilized that network to leverage a claim to millions of acres of Montana on which to fatten cattle. Through those same networks, the XIT and operations like it, discouraged or at least managed settlement in and access to the regions by gaining entry into the community echelons of power. The XIT's Montana operation was from the beginning a temporary solution for an ongoing problem, cash flow. The XIT only ran a cattle operation from 1885 to 1912. <laughs> Nevertheless, from Dalhart, Texas to Fallon, Montana, the XIT left an indelible mark 
on the people and culture there. In story, song, celebration, the ranch is still remembered as one of the great outfits of the old American West. Yet as reflected in the dates of its operation, the XIT got in late to the game. In a less remembered past, the Western cattle business was primarily controlled from boardrooms in Chicago, St. Louis, London, or Helena, Montana. Rather than cowboy boots on the ground, the typical large cattle operation by 1890 depended on, as much on its cadre of clerks and accountants and the pathways of capital they tracked in their books and balance sheets. The memories of, that people hang on to about those iconic ranches often are based on what they know about the managers, foremen, and top hands of the outfits, not about the organization that employed them. Operated by a cabal of Illinois businessmen, the XIT Ranch was underwritten by foreign capital. The original ranch owners, the Illinois capitalists known as the Capital Syndicate, are never intended cattle ranching as, as their uh, ultimate goal. They saw colonization as the route to riches. Until demand for their capital reservation acreage improved, the men settled on cattle ranching. Strapped for cash by this capital project, the syndicate sought out British help in the costly venture. A London corporation was formed in 1885, Capital Freehold Land and Investment Company Limited, and they sold five and seven percent uh, five and seven percent debentures which they accumulated $15 million to the ranching operation. The syndicate, the capital syndicate, leased back the ranch and the cattle from Capital Freehold and operated the outfit known as XIT. XIT is one example of, land and, of dozens of land and cattle companies that dominated among Western beef suppliers by the last decade of the 19th century. Non-local or foreign principals owned many Western livestock operations, partially or wholly. They had close ties to the livestock commission houses that had become the main intermediary to both the packing houses and the railroads. Small livestock operators were marginalized. Although news, newspapers and populists, populist politicians denounced the beef trust, the model dominated the industry over the next two decades and molded the framework for the modern meat industry. Many early stock growers found their knowledge and experience and connections useful and became land and cattle brokers as a scramble erupted, seeking control of what those washed out in the wake of the big die-up left behind. In Montana, a relatively small group of men virtually controlled the new state's productive grazing regions. Another great storm 20 years later in 1906-1907 signaled the beginning of the end of the most, for most of these imperial ranches as settlement and insular livestock production replaced the conveyor belt of Texas and southwestern bred stockers that had become the foundation of the eastern Montana cattle industry. The first line the first rail line reached uh, the Texas ranch in 1888. Others did not follow quickly. The slow expansion of railroads into Texas cattle regions contributed to an image problem for Texas beef in the late 1880s. <coughs> splenic fever, splenic <coughs> fever, a tick-borne protozoan infection causing horrifying deaths to cattle had long been a concern of northern beef growers. While the parasite left the longhorns, coasters, the cowboys called them, unscathed, it could be devastating to other breeds of cattle, like the newer European varieties increasingly being imported to the U.S. The actual toll on northern cattle is really hard to assess, but the idea that it could be a problem hurt Texas cattle. Campaigns by the big four packing houses, Armour, Hammond, Morris and Swift encouraged changes in consumer tastes. Buyers wanted young, 
fattened cattle. They spurned the Texas-raised longhorns, urging on the perception that the durable breed provided little more than canning-grade meat. Buyers claimed that cattle raised on the northern Great Plains or in feedlots springing up throughout the Mid Plains put on weight faster, experienced better rail service, and suffered fewer losses during transport. The latter two claims certainly have validity. The former deserves closer examination. By 1888, breeding up had taken root at the ranch and became a preoccupation for the syndicate. They began buying higher grade bulls, initially Shorthorns and Herefords. Eventually, the ranch depended primarily on Black Angus bulls for their com commercial production while maintaining a purebred Hereford herd to provide brood cows and for show. Still, in 1890, High-grade bees were a few, few years off for the XIT, and rangy coasters were the best they could stage for the moment. Once, the syndicate in, envisioned 300,000 head of beef grazing across their millions of Texas acres, but found 100,000 a challenge. Losses accumulated and something had to be done. The company spent months corresponding with people across the country about finishing XIT cattle. In 1889, the syndicate made a deal with J.W. Driscoll to stock his range, bridging the borders of South Dakota, Wyoming, and Montana with 15,000 head of XIT steers. Even before the results of that experiment came to fruition, the company committed to other finishing operations. Proclamation issued by President Benjamin Harrison in February of 1890, ordering non-Indian stock growers out of certain areas in Indian territory, gave the syndicate their final push. The syndicate's interest in Indian territory grazing undoubtedly turned on the opportunities offered from their action rather than any imposition caused by it. The syndicate saw two possible benefits in the action. First, the order clearing the Cherokee Strip anticipated the govern government opening the area to settlement. Any plan that brought potential buyers closer to their land in Texas suited XIT ownership. Second, the closing of the Indian Territory grazing, long used by South Texas cattle raisers as an intermediate stage to condition quarantine cattle, meant that their stock raisers would have to look elsewhere to feed their animals. A Scottish immigrant, an accountant for the John V. Farwell Company, Finley had been at the Texas ranch since 1887, working with the XIT's second ranch manager, A.G. Boyce, to integrate the ranching operation more closely into the company's overall corporate structure, a complex triangle of reporting that linked Chicago, London, and the Texas ranch. <clears throat> Finley took over the ranch as the ranch uh, business manager in Chicago in November of 1889. He, f he finally ably filled the role of the ranch's chief operating officer throughout the remainder of its operation and as an inf influential leader of Capital Freehold's successor, Capital Land Trust, in 1920, in, uh, until his death in 1927. Finley corresponded feverishly with agencies of the meat industry. Feeders and stalkers, bankers, buyers, railroad men, commission men, the icons of the cattle business like Charles Goodnight, Ike Pryor, Zeke Newman. The company was not committed to a specific plan. They preferred an option which other parties oversaw XIT cattle sent to them. Findlay did not want for offers. Throughout that winter, he stirred the pot for opportunity and parried offers of a variety of schemes from an array of sources. Finley and Boyce attended the Interstate Cattle Convention held in Fort Worth beginning March 11, 1890. Finley met two men with substantial interests in the Montana cattle business. John Clay, Jr., a legendary Wyoming cattleman and head of the Livestock Commission House Clay Robinson and Company, was the de facto leader of Wyoming's big cattle business and cast a wide shadow around him. 
Seth Mabry, a Kansas City livestock and land broker, was there too. Mabry is probably best known as one half of Mabry and Carter, the owners of the Circle Ranch on the Redwater in what was uh, then Northwest Dawson County. Communication continued upon Finley's return to Chicago. Finley also began arranging a trip to Montana. Only personal attention could justify a final decision. Finley boarded a westbound train in Chicago the evening of April 3rd, 1890. Earlier in the day, he forwarded general instructions to Boyce concerning several ranch projects then underway. Finley also told Boyce he wanted cattle prepared for delivery by rail or trail somewhere in the north. Where, when, and how to deliver them remained a mystery for the moment, even to Finley. In another letter responding to an offer of a Montana ranch, Finley expressed offense that the sender questioned the syndicate's motives for seeking northern cattle range. Fatter cattle for the ranch was his goal, the Scott wrote back. Nothing compelled his company's interest. In any case, he found the correspondence suggested price too high. I go north tonight, Finley concluded dismissively. He didn't much fit the image of a, the viceroy of a cattle empire when stepping off a great northern Pullman in the northeastern Montana town of Glasgow a few days later. Guided by Charles Hawley, a local businessman, and a well-known wolfer named Joe Butch, Finley looked at the Milk River country and roamed south into the Missouri Valley. He seemed sold when he wrote Boyce after his return to Chicago. Finley stayed at the Park Hotel in Great Falls on April 8th. He likely met with important leaders in the state's cattle business there or in Helena. Finley had a decade-long relationship with Thomas C. Power, who was this, just then joining one of the syndicate members, Charles B. Farwell, in the United States Senate. It would be important that Finley discuss the syndicate's Montana pl plans with men like Power. Without approval from the six-month-old state's livestock oligarchy, XIT entry into the state would have been difficult. Finley corresponded with Alfred Myers of Myers Brothers near Livingston. Myers operated three ranches in the Yellowstone and Shields River Valleys. Finley also corresponded with Captain William Harmon of Miles City. Meyer and Harmon were char charter members of the Montana Stock Growers Association. Finley would have taken advantage of early arriving attendees of the group's annual meeting opening April 15th in Miles City. Introduced by Harmon or Myers, perhaps, he likely met with local and out-of-town out attendees that weekend. F.A. Lisk, a well-known Miles City resident, reported to the Yellowstone Journal of that city on April 10th, having just returned from a hunting excursion with Mr. and Mrs. Cameron. The hunting party had bagged a bear. Display of its head and hide and tales of the pursuit stirred excitement among the townsfolk. The paper, paper's editor was also excited about Lisk's report on range and cattle conditions he observed on the expedition. Lisk told the newspaper paper he'd looked over many fine specimen, specimens of N bar N, LU bar, and bow and arrow cattle and the grass was in good shape. Lisk was just the sort of person that Finley would have wanted to talk to, and they were likely in town at the same time. Finley's whereabouts uh, after visiting Great Falls are unconfirmed. Whatever he did, he did it fast because he's back in Chicago by April 16th. Finley was back in Texas by May 1st. He still had not settled on a range. He was weighing options in Wyoming and in the Dakotas. In Montana, he considered the Muscle Shell and Milk River Valleys. He lamented the additional distance and hazard so far north. He hoped for something nearer to Driscoll, but learned much of the region south of the Yellowstone was already overstocked and being taken up quickly by homesteaders. Finley and Boyce soon hired Cato, Leaving shipping to Boyce, Finley and Cato left Texas and made their way to Windover by May 30th. 
They began unlo unloading cattle on June 1st, but it was June 9th before all the cattle uh, arrived. Finley and Cador are difficult to track for the next few weeks. Unloaded, a nearly two-month journey still was ahead for the cattle and cowboys if their destination was the Yellowstone River. Again, it's not clear Finley had yet made that decision. On July 11th, a notice appeared, the Yellowstone Journal, that the IXT brand of about 10,000 head of cattle will locate on the north side. The paper reported on Lisk again a few days later, this time announcing his return from escorting Mr. Finley into the north side country. Lisk recommended Finley and Capital Freehold in their application to the Montana Stock Growers Association. Official approval waited for the next annual meeting, but their $2 membership fee was accepted and the iconic brand was registered on August 16th. On July 16th, the journal reported the, the XIT outfit yesterday purchased Tussler and Kempton's range on Cedar Creek near Terry. The, the consideration paid, we did not learn. The paper informed readers July 22nd that O.C. Cato and J.D. Corliss of Minneapolis were visitors in the city yesterday. A top hand on the Texas ranch, Corliss brought many Texas herds into Montana. Seth Mabry was also seen about the country in July. Mabry was there to observe his arriving Texas trail cattle and probably to meet with Finley, the Circle's range merged with what was now the XIT's range on the divide, high ground splitting the water, uh, runoff of the country into that that flowed into the Yellowstone and that that flowed into the Missouri. With the cattle spreading across their new range, and what photographer L.A. Huffman called the Big Open, Finley returned to Chicago August 7th. Boyce began, Boyce began shipping Texas cattle to Chicago August 21st. Driscoll began loading cars a few days later in South Dakota. By September 3rd, Boyce had shipped nearly 3,000 head, all but 63 being steers. Driscoll shipped just over 1,400 steers during the same period. The Texas cattle averaged 1,057 pounds and brought an average $2.68 per hundredweight. Driscoll's finished steers averaged 1,090 pounds and returned an average $3.48. <laughs> Finley, who spent much of the month overseeing the cattle sales in Chicago, had little time to contemplate the results. The winter three years past had not been erased from people's memories. Finley spoke of it with his new Montana friends and he wrote the syndicate men to ease their concerns. The arrival of a tax bill from Custer County on the newly arrived Texans outraged Finley. <laughs> he immediately engaged a lawyer in Miles City, Judge Jason Strevel, a pioneering member of the Montana Stock Growers Association and a respected community citizen. I will not pay taxes twice on cattle, Finley wrote. Indeed, the company had paid over $12,000 to Texas tax collectors at the end of 1889. Whether these particular cattle were assessed in Texas for 1890 is not known, but Stress Strevel was successful in front of the county's Board of Equalization. This would not be the last company appearance before the county tax board. Likely, like today's corporations, these operations did what they could to lessen their burden. The company paid its greatest share of taxes in Dawson County rather than in Custer County. <coughs> Both the original XIT purchase from Tussler and Kempton and the Hatchet, purchased a few years later from C.B. Mendenhall, were located in Dawson County at the time. The company did pay taxes in Custer County. The Glendive Independent 
regularly reported on the County Board of Equalization and the county's heaviest taxpayers. The XIT did not appear, of course, in the paper's heavy taxpayers list in 1890. Apart from the railroads, the homeland and co cattle company, owned by the Niedringhaus brothers, the N bar N of St. Louis, had been Dawson County's heaviest tax contributor for several years. Pierre Weibo uh, began challenge, challenging the Niedringhaus operation in the, in the county's as the county's largest livestock grower in 1889. Homeland and cattle held on to the top spot during the 1890s uh, until closing out in 1897. The XIT joined the top owners in 1891 when Cato, presumably representing capital freehold, was assessed $20,020 on cattle and improvements in Dawson County. The XIT cattle company paid about $1,380 in Custer County that year. For most of the 1890s, the syndicate was among Dawson County's top five taxpayers. The syndicate's highest known payment came in 1898 when they de deposited $5,553 in the Dawson County coffers. From 1890 to 1900, excluding railroads again, uh, no other entity paid more taxes in a year than the N bar N did in several years. In 1891, they paid the county $10,078. The lowest home payment was the year they closed out the Montana cattle operation, when they paid uh, $4,705. Capital Freehold that year paid $3,950. Cato and the XIT outfit quickly gained local admiration. The XIT became a key component in the region's sense of community. Only a few men worked full-time with the company in Montana. Brandups brought the most employment. The XIT needed about 15 to 20 cowboys, a couple of cooks, and a couple of range bosses. Probably no more than three or four hands stayed on through winters. When cattle were trailed up, once delivered, most of the cowboys were paid off and offered a train ticket back to Texas. Open range cattle ranching was a bottom line business and cowboys everywhere found the off months difficult. The last XI trail herds came, went north in 1897, the same year the company decided to replace the legendary XIT brand with a more conservative Long X. The company suspended Montana operation that year. When XIT cattle from Texas began arriving again in 1903, they came on ra rail cars and unloaded at Glendive. The reasons for the XIT's first departure from the state are unclear. Some evidence suggests that even in Montana, XIT cattle did not always market as well against neighbors' cattle. By 1901, the ranch had established itself as a premier <coughs> cattle breeder focusing on the purebred Angus and the quality hybrid Angus-sired whiteface cattle. The pasturage in Texas shrunk significantly after 1900 with big sales to other ranchers. Reducing their range, of course, again, limited the proper profitability of their cattle operation, squeezing cash flow. They weren't yet positioned financially to give up the cattle business, the syndicate, and they began sending steers again north in uh, 1903. Uh, there is some other evidence that suggests a deal that was made in 1898 for the entire Texas operation, but that it fell through. Texas land sales accelerated after the turn of the century. British creditors remain mostly disappointed in their investment. Many of those holding the long matured bonds sold from 1885 to 1889, chose to return them at discounts when the syndicate began a buyback campaign in 1904. They failed to convince all their investors, however, and the terms for many of the land deals did not provide large upfront payments. The cattle operation remained necessary for providing uh, ready capital that would appease the thinning group of foreign investors. The company redeemed the last of its public debentures in 1908. After John V. Farwell, 
the last survi survivor of the original syndicate, died in 1908, the XIT began closing out its Montana operation for good. Company heirs showed little interest in the cattle business. Four years later, the syndicate sold the last of their Texas cattle and leased the last of their pasturage. When the ranch's last manager, Bob Duke, reported the company's final cattle sales in 1912, he included nearly 500 steers sold from the Montana range. A Montana wit speaking years later at a gathering of old timers in Lewistown, Lewistown chose both to honor the XIT and to complain to management about his banquet meal, suggesting the great compliment his hosts showed in serving the stringy, tough remains of the last XIT steer in Montana. <laughs> The syndicate reclaimed the company's outstanding shares from remaining British stockholders in 1915. As capital land trusts, the company continued actively leasing and selling land in the early 1940s. Family heirs sold the last of their capital reservation property in 1963. Still, many of those people who have heard of the ranch are surprised to learn it has, has, hasn't existed for over 100 years. This shows the strong grip that the enterprise had on historical memory. Finley visited the, ran the Montana ranch often. His presence noted in local newspapers was always greeted with pleasance. Finley, Cato, and Boyce benefited generously from the company's eventual success. But the three, along with the cowboys, cooks, wranglers, windmill men, wolfers, and many others that were part of the big ranch, big ranch's dominion, should be noted for the reputation they brought to an outside, exploitive, capital-driven industry that took away much more from the places it operated than it left behind. For all the thousands of cattle, the XIT employed few people on its Montana ranch year-round. Those multiplied over 19 years and mixed with those from other outfits. The XIT, for the most part, hired good men Many that came and stayed in Montana found wives or brought them along. Many of them came from Texas, but many did not. Nevertheless, a distinct, maybe even unique culture developed in the Northern Ranges. It's not quite a Texas culture. Much of the brashness of Texas is missing there, replaced by a confident humility. Still, people there are conservative, suspicious of liberals and the left, at least on a generic basis. People in both areas are intensely proud of their frontier past, friendly and open to all, neither Texans nor Montanans were always that way. Much of the original XIT ranch in Texas now supports irrigated fields of cash crops. Much of it too support, still supports cattle, and much of it is being allowed to return to a time before plows and cattle. In Montana, fewer farm operations have changed the landscape of the XIT's two million acres. The homesteaders came and went, and the big open remains just that, with probably fewer cattle. Thanks. <laughs>